This episode is brought to you by Hunt Hickory Creek. And new to Hunt Hickory Creek this year is their Central Kansas Lodge. They're going to be running hunters from the end of October all the way through January. And their main hunting area is located between Kavira National Refuge and Cheyenne Bottoms. Central Kansas is a special place for waterfowl hunting. And during the peak migration, those refuges hold hundreds of thousands, if not close to millions of ducks and geese at a time. Mainly speckle belly, snow, and lesser Canada geese, mallards, pintails, and widgeon. You may have an opportunity to harvest all of these species in one hunt. You'll be very comfortable every morning in their Avian X A-frame blinds or laying on backboards, and they hunt over 1,200 of the industry's finest decoys. So visit their website at www.hunthickorycreek.com for booking information and follow them throughout the year on Facebook and Instagram. And don't miss your opportunity at a hunt of a lifetime with Hunt Hickory Creek. If you're going to hunt Kansas, hunt Hickory Creek. Welcome to the Fowl Front Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where our goal is to recruit and educate new hunters while entertaining the rest of you. Without new hunters and the mentorship of those more seasoned, this passion as we know it faces an uncertain future. So get the word out, turn the volume up, and enjoy the show, because you're on the Fowl Front. Big news. As most of you know, we're running a 4th of July week-long giveaway, or multiple giveaways, over at the Fowl Front Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast group on Facebook. And Hunt Hickory Creek is giving away a three-day, four-night waterfowl hunting package in central Kansas, the heart of the central flyway and right between two of the biggest waterfowl wintering locations. Three days, four nights, for free. And all you got to do is head over to our listener group, the Fowl Front Waterfowl Podcast Group, request to join, answer the three entrance questions, and boom, you are in. Then once you're there, just go to the top post, the stickied one that's announcing that giveaway, and just like it so that we know that you're interested, and that's how you are entered. It's free. Head on over there. You'd be silly not to, and we look forward to meeting you in there. Okay, today on the show, we have Chef Bree from Wilderness to Table, uh, and a few other things. Uh, Chef, you want to go ahead and give us a... uh a uh, little introduction. Well, I'm Chef Bram with Wilderness, Wilderness to Table. So I um, created my little website that is now a TV show, and I'm now host of Wilderness to Table on Amazon Prime. Oh, awesome. So how did, well, first off, how did you get into the culinary arts? Um, I, well, my first job was throwing pizza dough when I was in college. <laughs> oh, nice. So that's how it started. And then um, I sat in an office cubicle and hated it and decided to pursue my passion. So I've been actually working in some of America's and Europe's finest restaurants. So I've been doing it for a while. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So, okay. How does that parallel with hunting? How, How did you get into hunting? So, um, I was a culinary chef instructor at my alma mater and I was teaching the restaurant. So basically it's a, it was a culinary school And the last phase of the program is we actually run a restaurant where it's open to public. So I was teaching that and I was taking my students to local farms, um, sourcing organic vegetables and fruit, and we would base menus off of that. And so I was really teaching them the importance of the quality of ingredients really make the dish amazing. And then I was just thinking like, wow, I really can't take them to like factory farms. That's horrible. (laughs) Uh, that is not the purest form uh, of protein possible so because as being a chef I know what's in their diet I know I was always paying attention to where my protein came from and then I moved to Georgia and I started getting into archery and six months later I was sitting in a deer stand trying to source my own protein because I thought well you know if I might as well do it myself So it was the chef in me that inspired me to become a hunter to harvest the purest form of organic protein and humanely treated as well. So that's how it all came about. Yeah, I think it's always interesting that uh, when I bring it up to somebody like they say, oh, I don't know where that duck has been. I don't know where that deer has been. And I said, well, (laughs) you don't want to know where that chicken that's on your plate. uh, You don't want to know where that's been. That cow had a way worse life 
than the poor deer, like the deer that I shot or harvested, I should yeah. say. Absolutely. So what was your, you said your first hunt was, um, well, what, a Georgia whitetail? Yes. Extremely hot weather. And that was my first hunt. <laughs> I didn't, I missed on my first one and went out three days later and I was able to harvest my first doe. So it's been nonstop ever since. <laughs> how many, how many years ago was your first hunt? You said, Oh my God, like six or seven years ago, I'd say. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah. did you grow up around hunting at all? Oh, you'll love this. No, I didn't. Um, I'm born and raised in California and growing up, my parents were very, av- not very avid, um, animal rights activists. So I actually grew up the opposite. I thought hunters were evil. And I was like, why would you want to kill such a beautiful animal? I don't understand it. And so that's how I was raised. I wasn't raised going hunting with my dad. We would go fishing and stuff, but we would always release. So, um, we wouldn't even cook what we caught, but that, so it's kind of an ox or a juxtaposition on my background and my parents still don't understand me, but that's okay. The chef in me had led me to get the purest organic protein possible. But so, yeah, I, I, I wasn't raised tempting. I've kind of stumbled this all upon, you know, my quest for better food. That's how it came about. Yeah. And I, it's very, it's very interesting. And, and it's nice to hear that too, because that's kind of, you know, that's who I'm really trying to get to with this podcast is somebody that, uh, doesn't have a mentor or somebody to take them out into the woods or out on the marsh and, and get them out there. And they, but they have this, this burn inside of them or this, you know, whatever it is that puts us out there. Um, but they don't have the knowledge or the skill set yet. And that's kind of what we're, we do here on, on the foul front. Right. It can be a little off putting for somebody where I, I mean, I, I know firsthand trying to get into hunting and you have no background into it. And especially being a female, it makes it very hard. When I first started, they were like, is this ammo? Is this the ammo your husband wanted? I'm like, oh. <laughs> no, this is the ammo that I want. So, I mean, there's obstacles like that, but you know, one great thing is like, if you're worried about it, try going with an outfitter first, you know? and learning and seeing how they do it. And then going from there, if you could start somehow, you know, just, just to get out there. Right. Right. So I think I was scrolling through your, your Instagram page and I saw that you, you harvested a black buck with, with an air rifle. Is that, is that correct? (laughs) Yes. You'll see it all on, um, I think it premieres, um, on American air gunner. And it'll premiere in January on, um, or Jan, July, excuse me, January, July on the pursuit channel. Okay. So yeah, I got to harvest my first black buck with a 50 caliber air rifle, which was freaking amazing. (laughs) Who knew that like air gun comes so long. Like I had an air gun as a kid and used to shoot little cans and now it's like, they're huge. I mean, and the power behind it was, it was really awesome. So y'all stay tuned for that on the pursuit channel. I'll definitely keep my eye out. So, okay. What was your first waterfowl hunt? Um, back in the day it was, um, diver docks off of Mississippi. Nice. Nice. Yeah. The coast of Mississippi. How long into your hunting career as it were, where was that? Um, Gosh, I'd probably say like a year later, I was really getting into waterfowl. I actually start, I, so trap and skeet and clays actually really got me loving waterfowl because I mean, shooting a shotgun is so much fun. I mean, just shooting clays is so much fun. So then that's, that's how I actually was like, oh, I got to get out here and get some ducks. Plus I really, really love duck. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I went. So uh, so it's kind of funny that I went for my diver duck as my first one, but diver yeah. ducks don't oh, taste great. <laughs> no, <laughs> manipulate <that's>... them. <laughs> Good, and I'm glad you you preface there's a little intro there. We'll be talking about that, I'm sure. Right, but then they'd be like, "Chef Breed doesn't know anything." <laughs> All right, so we talked about your first waterfowl hunt, but what was your favorite waterfowl hunt? Um. Canada geese was up there. Um, 
when that was my first dog led one, I'm pretty much a sucker for anything dog led, whether it's <laughs> upland game. Yeah. Um, there's just something so magical about, you know, harvesting an animal from the sky and then another animal getting so excited to bring it back to you. So probably Canada geese, um, in, where was I in South Dakota or North Dakota? One of Dakota, the Dakotas, it was amazing. So much fun. Yes. Yes. Well, shall we get into the, the meat of the episode as it were? Sure. Okay. So I guess uh, the first thing I think we should probably start off with is, um, the preparation of, wild fowl meat. Um, I, we know that, you know, there's the, we can breast it out or we can pluck it. Um, are there other options? Um, and is there, or is there a right and a wrong way to, um, breast out or pluck, um, your, your table fare? So, um, the thing with wild game is, once you harvest an animal, or I like to say harvest instead of shot because people associate it, you know, wrong. But anyway, so once you harvest your animal, you, ha- I, I'm the chef in me is like, Oh my gosh, get it on ice, get it on ice because you want to stop that buildup of lactic acid as fast as you can. So it's that lactic acid that's going to get into the muscles and really bring out the game gamey taste in your meat. So the first thing that you want to do is, is chill it as fast as you can that goes with, you know, whitetail or waterfowl. And there is no wrong way to butcher, um, like waterfowl. The thing is, I, I like to, when I'm in the field, I know what I want ahead of time. So I will butcher it how I want right away. Mm -hmm. So whether I want to leave them whole and hurry up and pluck, and then I vacuum seal as fast as I can. Um, and then, or breast out. So, that's a huge thing. That's the biggest thing I can say is go into it knowing like, okay, I want two whole ducks and then I'm going to breast out five. And then that way you're going to, you know, right away, they're not sitting. The acids are not, you know, all the blood isn't, hasn't seeped into it and it hasn't had a chance to kind of let that rigor mortis set in. And that's really going to help the flavor of your wild game, your waterfowl. Question. Are you... That, so that's very interesting that you go into the hunt and you're thinking about, well, well I'm going to make this dish or I'm going to make it, I need it this way. And that's, that's very interesting because um, I think it's the evolution um, of, uh, of a hunter's progression is, you know, that doesn't come till much later. Um, right. And that, that's a critical point because it actually alters the flavor of the meat. So follow up. Follow up question to that is: Are you, if I have you in my blind, are you, when a duck comes back, when the dog brings the duck back, are you whipping out your knife right then and there? Because that's what it sounded like. Putting it on ice. I'm probably putting on ice as fast as I can. Well, you know, because I mean, when you're duck hunting or goose hunting, you you shoot a lot more than you probably need. So, but what I try to do is have a cooler with ice, and then the first shots that I'm getting. Um, they go right on ice. And then after that, I can handle the meat later. Um, cause usually it's cold when you're waterfowl hunting anyway. So technically you don't have to worry about it, but I like to get them as chilled down as possible as I can. That way I know because, because I'm a professional chef. And so I know like, okay, I need, I need a minimum of six birds. So then those first six are going in the cooler right away. And then I can, I can manipulate the taste with the others later with um, ingredients and marinades and everything like that. You were talking a little bit about um, lactic acid. What is mm-hmm. what is that game taste? Um, what is it? It's that it's that buildup of lactic acid in, in in the animal. So, and it's also how much blood. So, think about like that flight or flight, or think about if you. Let's see. What's a good description? Like if you go into, um, you're in a hot jacuzzi and then you go into an ice bath, that shock of your muscles is like, holy guacamole. Like you have that jolt through your whole body. Well, when technically I would say like when those shots are fired and that's what goes through the bird's body or animal's body, it's especially like whitetail because they're still running. Um, and it, it, if you're a good enough shot, the water, they, you know, they pass fairly quickly, but sometimes they don't. And so that's, 
that stress of the animal is now going into the meat. And that is what's creating that wild, that gamey taste that we tend to not like. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So past that preparation techniques. So, um, I am always brining or I'm always marinating. Uh, what, what other options do we have? Um, well, if you are the adventurous foodie, my favorite way to cook any goose or duck is usually sous vide. Sous vide is a water bath cooking method. So you cryovac it in plastic bags and then you cook it at a low temperature for a longer period of time. And that's going to make it really tender. It's going to keep all the juices inside. So it's not going to have the time to release uh, any water that's in there. So that helps keep them the biggest thing you have to worry about with waterfowl is it drying out so you really want to have so think of incorporating fats when you're cooking your um, waterfowl like goose and duck so that will help make it less dry and nice and moist and tender but tender comes from cooking low and slow right right so what is the what's the difference between a brine and a marinade um, a brine is a saltwater is a, a saltwater bath basically. So you're using salt to draw out the moisture of the meat, but then you're using the salt to push back a lot more water into the meat. So that's a brine, and a marinade is imparting flavor um, into the meat as opposed to putting in water. Do you okay. know what I mean? Yeah, you can yeah. flavor some brines, but it's not going to be flavorful as like a marinade is. Right. Okay. And a marinade won't penetrate as deep uh, into the tissue as a brine will because of the salt. But then you can use soy sauce a lot of times. I use soy sauce with waterfowl um, because of the salt content in soy sauce with the marinades. It kind of helps do a quick brine marinade version of that. Okay. Okay. Okay, the fat in the silver skin on ducks, um, when we're especially like when breasting out, um, do we do we want to keep those or is it is it situation dependent? Everybody always told me when I was you know coming up, but they said, oh, you got to get that silver skin off there and you got to get the fat off there. Well, I agree with the silver skin completely. I uh, mean, there's really no use to it and you really can't eat it. I mean. That stuff is tough. <laughs> right. Then um, fat, I keep the fat on everything. So the fat to me is like precious gold because later on when you're like like breasting out ducks, like that fat, there is nothing better than cooking the breast in its own fat. Like when I went on a bear hunt, I savored every last bit of that fat to cook it in its own fat because it enhances the flavor of that animal. So for me is I'm like, don't throw it away. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you using um, when you're either breasting out or extracting the meat or plucking? Are you, I mean, what kind of knife are you using? Are you using, I know people, some people use scalpels. Some people use um, big <laughs> knives. Some people use tiny little knives. And Right. So usually um, uh, the chef in me is, I'm, I'm like, dedicated to my global knives and I'll use those on waterfowl because they're so easy. I won't necessarily use them on whitetail or anything. Okay. But they're kitchen knives, a, a huge global fan and a Wustoff fan. So I'll usually use the carving knives um, for geese and just like a 12 inch chef knife for ducks. And that will get me through the whole bird or a cleaver when I'm, you're doing the head and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually just use my my regular chef's knife that I would in the kitchen for all of that. Okay. Unless it's like I'm out in the field and I don't want to take them along, then usually they're like bubble blades or something like that. Okay. Okay. So what what is there anything that we need to be mindful of when we're out in the field if maybe we don't have the best uh, specimen or the best um, – oh – Anything to look out for to make, you know, the, we always say the meat's, you know, really great, but sometimes we run into things like rice breast, um, or, or things of that manner. Yeah. I mean, 
Shot placement is the biggest thing because obviously if you're putting pellets into your breast meat, you're getting uh, it's in it's creating bruises and then those aren't really tasty. So, I mean, shot placement is probably the best thing you can do to ensure good tasting meat. Okay. And so when you, we, let's say we do get a, um, a bird that's really busted up. Um, and usually we just, I just chase the, the, the pellets out with, or the BBs out with, um, you know, I follow the hole and I kind of push my finger all the way through to make sure. Um, but, uh, is there, is there anything that you do if you have a particularly banged up bird and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to use this for a different kind of thing. Yeah. I'll probably grind it. Okay. And then I'll either create, you know, even don't be afraid to like use, um, waterfall meat to make dry cured meats. I do, I do salamis and Genoa's all the time with them. If you have the time for that, I happen to think it's amazing, but right. <laughs> people don't want to geek out like that. Like I do. So, I mean, I use it in, in replace like you would beef or anything. And that's why you need to save the fat because when you're making anything, you can still make goose sausage and you can make duck sausage from like a really beat up pieces of meat. So don't, don't waste them, just grind them up. But that's why you need the fat to incorporate into there in, in that. I think, um, another thing that is a huge misconception and you already talked about it a little bit, um, about overcooking, um, uh, waterfowl. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the first time that I prepared, um, a goose steak for my wife, um, she said, well, what temperature did you bring it up to? And I said, oh, you know, like 140 or 150. I can't remember what it was, but, and she said, oh my gosh, it has to get to <laughs> Ben. That's foul. You know, like, and I said, oh, I don't, it's not the same as farm raised birds. So I, I guess I was going to ask you what temperature do we bring you know, birds too. Well, the safety, <laughs> I should say, I'm going to preface this. The safety zone is always 165, okay. right? According to, according to healthcare standards. What I do. So if I'm cooking it in my restaurant, I definitely have to make sure that that meat comes to temperature to 165, obviously for legal reasons and health codes and all that stuff. But that's when I make sure it's well brined and everything so that it doesn't dry out. But when I, you were, you were right um, when you said something earlier. So at home or even in the restaurant, there's carryover cooking. So I will usually pull my waterfowl, duck or goose, whatever it is, out once it reaches about 148. And that carryover cooking, and I keep it on a hot plate for till it, basically till it reaches about 163. And then I'll pull it off like onto a cool plate. And it will get up to that 165, but it's not going to dry it out. It's it's, it's that like that low and slow, like it's slowly going over there. So the thing is, if you're cooking your duck breast in a pan and it's on medium high heat and you're like, oh, it's 165 and then you pull it off. Well, it still has about 10 to 15 degrees of carryover cooking. So you've essentially overcooked it by pulling it at 165. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you want to pull it earlier than 165 so that it will get to temp and it's not raw and you've killed off anything that's in there, but you're not overcooking it. Okay. Excellent. Good to know. So we were both like halfway right there. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess let's move into, let's highlight some favorite, you know, duck recipes of yours. And I would like to start it off with um, one of my one of my listeners. Uh, when I asked several of them, they they wanted to know. Um, they said, "Well, you know, wildfowl is it's a semi acquired taste. Um, mm-hmm. So, what can I prepare for my loved ones in, in order to introduce them and then begin training their palates? It's kind of an introductory to game meat, um, something that's good to the unlearned palate, I guess. Right. So. So waterfowl is an interesting thing because you see either you're for it or against it. And so to train somebody to like it. So I believe as a chef, the number one way to get inspiration and to see how things are done is to travel. And so I've traveled um, a lot throughout Asia. And the country that I found the most 
um, who uses a lot of waterfowl is China. And the way they prepare it is with a lot of Asian ingredients. And now America has become more accustomed to Asian flavors. Seems like we all love sushi and we all love the flavors of soy sauce and scallions and sesame oil. So to me, that is a great way to start preparing waterfowl or especially duck is give them flavors that they're already used to, but with a different meat, then they won't get thrown off. So that's how I like to do it. And especially what I learned, like, especially in China is their flavors go hand in hand. Like they, the Asian cultures really do a good balance, like a yin and yang. They all, they both, they, they work together. And so that's how I would say start off with some Asian fl- Asian flavors. That's the best way. Every time like I, I like serve waterfowl or like chucker, when I have lots of chucker, I will like make Korean fried chucker <laughs> and people are like, this is amazing, but they wouldn't eat it by itself. Right. So that's, I usually do, that's how I usually introduce people instead of just cooking up a breast and slicing it and say, here you go. <laughs> right. This, this might uh, draw some a target on my back from chefs and waterfowl hunters alike, but one of my favorite uh, recipes for divers, I call it surf and turf chili, and because, you know, people tend to say that, you know, diver ducks taste a little bit like, you know, seafood. Sea. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I put um, some of the, the less desirable venison cuts that I have and um, diver meat into a, a chili. Um, uh-huh. And uh, I, I found that my wife thinks that that is palatable. So, <laughs> yeah, See, that that's a good way. Chili is also a good vessel to introduce people because they, they're eating it without really knowing they're eating it. But when it comes to like diver ducks, I'm a firm believer at what, what grows together goes together. So if diver ducks taste like the sea, try pairing it with like, a fish broth or, or a fish or scallops, um, then it's flavors that you're used to and it'll only enhance it. So that's kind of what I do. So like I create, I I think about their habitat and what they're eating and where they live and what ingredients are found in that area. And generally those are the things that are always going to go pair nicely with it. And diver duck is, is one of them. Diver duck actually pairs really well for like seafood chowders and everything like that. Okay, so that's a good transition. What are some of your favorite uh, favorite diver recipes? Oh, the sea, a seafood chowder, actually. <laughs> seafood chowder, you mentioned. <laughs> okay. Because it's always so cold when you're out hunting them. It's like delicious at the end of a hunt. <laughs> yeah, that's a very that's very good. Uh, I mean, that sounds good. I've so. never been on a diver duck hunt where I'm like, oh, yes, I'm just perfectly comfortable, comfortable in this temperature. <laughs> 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 right, right. Where all have you shot uh, shot divers at? Just Mississippi. Mississippi. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, what is your favorite duck? Um, well, I guess it could be two different ducks. But what's your favorite duck to gun, and what's your favorite duck to eat? Uh, well, usually I'm gunning for my favorite one to eat. <laughs> I, I figured. Um, so I'd probably have to. Say mallards are probably my favorite because they have a really good fat on them. <laughs> right, right. And fat is delicious. Now I saw some snow goose um, mm-hmm. pictures on your Instagram. Can you walk me through other than um, maybe jerky or sausage? Um, how do we eat snow goose? So snow goose is really off. It's a really versatile protein for me. So what I do is I'll, I will cook it low and slow so that I can eventually shred it. And then I'll serve it just in anything that I would serve beef. So one of my highest hitting recipes, I think, on my website is snow goose barbacoa tacos. And so that's treat. That's like chipotle because I love chipotle. Right. Oh, I had chipotle <laughs> uh, yesterday. So. <laughs> oh my god! Like I'm like, give me Chipotle barbacoa any day. But and so I made the same thing with with snow goose, and it's it's a hit. So it's treated just so I treat it just the same. You just have to cook it a little bit differently. And I always I will cook it via so sous vide, um, or like if you really just want to make it easy, just put it in a crock pot with um, some beef stock and fill it up, filled like till it's almost covered. 
put beef stock on it, put it on for eight hours on low, and eventually it'll get so tender that it'll just shred apart just like beef would. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Take the fuss out of it. <laughs> right, right, right. I guess since we're going down the categories, okay, what's your favorite way to prepare mallards? Seared. Seared. A heavily salted skin, a skin to breast, um, heavily salted skin, um, ha- cross hatched and placed on a cast iron skillet and cooked what I, what in the chef would say unilaterally, which means you don't flip it. So the beautiful breast meat never touches the pan. So, okay. That's my favorite way to cook it. <laughs> yeah, t- okay. Tell me a little bit more about that. So when you're cooking something unilaterally, you're never flipping it like you would like a chicken breast, you know, when cook it on one side or cook it on the other. So mallards have that amazing, beautiful fat. So what you want to do is cross hatch the skin and then you're going to heavily salt it. So that skin is going to become like a chicharron, like um, very crispy. And that fat is going to render out eventually so that there's no fat between the skin and the meat. And then the meat is going to cook perfectly through. Without even flipping it. And, but my, but the thing is, use a cast iron skillet. Like, I'm a huge, people are always like, what pans do you use? I'm like, well, I do use Mauvel copper pans, but don't mess with my cast iron skillets because I use them for everything. <laughs> no one in my house is allowed to wash them except for me. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I guess, what else? Um, do you ever use the grill or anything else? Yes, I use um, I use a Camp Chef pellet smoker all the time, which is my go-to, nice. and that's low and slow. Everything low and slow on there. Right, right, right. Excellent. Okay, so your favorite, I guess, is there anything you do for you know you particularly like for Canada Goose? Uh no. I mean, I treat it the same way as I would. There's nothing like in particular I do with that that type that breed um it gets thrown in with every other goose so yeah i just just always i can't even stress it enough it's gonna be so boring like low and slow but really that produces the best cooked waterfowl ever unless it's like duck and you're searing and you're getting rid of fat because wild game doesn't have as much fat on them that's why you need to do low and slow really get that fat in there then yes Excellent. So let's transition over to jerkies and sausage. Mm-hmm. Do you know a thing or two about that? Yeah, well, we <laughs> talked about sausage. That's right. <laughs> I don't know all the time. Um, so, I mean, I probably say I enjoy making sausage more than jerky, okay. um, just because I tend to want to eat that more than I do jerky. Um, so my fort, I loved salami, and so I will make salami out of snow goose, mallard, whatever, but always with that fat. So that's something that I really enjoy. But it's you have to, I mean, you have to be really dedicated. And I say get like a whole, you know, those like little mini refrigerators. Yeah, they get for like a hundred bucks or something. Like get one and only use it for making like dry cured meats. We're, that's not sausages, which I like making dry cured meats out of it. Um, but it goes like with Greek turkey. So because you have to inoculate it with a certain type of mold. So, I mean, it's, it's for the diehard, but it's well worth it. Right. That, that does sound like the di- question for you. Is there, you know, and I've, I think I've seen it somewhere. Is there any way for a, a big old, you know, uh, goose breast, is there any way to make sort of uh, cold cuts or things like that? Yeah, so you can do like a dry cure on it and then put them in the refrigerator. Well, depends how thick it is. So I would probably butterfly it, you know, but then you're not getting a cold cut. Um, that's an interesting question. Maybe you just did stump the chef right now. Oh, because I, was, the, I did that. was not my intention. Because uh, just, the way the goose breast is, like, well, there's one thin part and there's one really thick part. Right. So a dry cure, to get it that way, is going to cure – over cure the thin part but not enough on the thick part so i don't know maybe if your viewer if your listeners have done it let me know and i'll okay. try it out <laughs> nice and actually you touched on on something there and i know you talked about sous vide 
um, earlier, but I think that's one of the, the more difficult parts of preparing, um, you know, wild fowl is because it's got that skinny part and it's got that thick part. Right. Is there so any... often, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You want to butterfly it. So okay. if you're cooking it and you want to, you're worried about cooking it evenly and not, co- not overcooking the thin parts, then butterfly it. So then you, they're basically the same width throughout. Okay. Excellent. How do you go about when you're making jerky and what's the best way to cut it into like uniform thin slices? I've tried like putting it on, like having a big knife with a, you know, a uniform like cutting surface that I just run the knife along, but I'm always like struggling with that. Ah, so this is so easy. So freeze it for probably about 30, 35 minutes. Okay. And then slice it. Oh, because it gets a little harder. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then you can get super thin slices and it's it's like a dream. (laughs) Awesome, awesome. And even better if you can freeze it for like the 35 to 45 minutes and then use like, um, I, I have, I just have like a little chef's choice slicer that I use. It's like mm-hmm. the one and it works amazing for stuff like that. But I'll, I will always make sure that I, it is partially frozen so that it creates those really nice, beautiful, consistent thin slices. Awesome. Awesome. So are there any huge, like, waterfowl culinary no-nos like what's the easiest way to ruin a dish overcooking it overcooking (laughs) (laughs) that's like a culinary no-no and everything it's like i mean so i have a huge respect for my animal protein well and my vegetables when i go to cook it because my philosophy is that is a life I took and I want to treat it with the utmost respect. So I go into it fully prepared. I'm not, you know, sitting there texting while my goose is on, you know, on the grill or on the saute pan. Um, because I believe my philosophy is I'm not doing it justice if I'm like overcooking it. Um, so a lot of times people get distracted and kids happen and, you know, it happens, but I try to devote time to make sure I do it right. And it's partially probably because of my training and I've been doing this for so long. Um, but yeah, that's the, I'm, I'm pretty much when I'm in the kitchen, it's like, don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go about, okay, let's say you're not cooking, um, this particular meat, um, for a while it's going perhaps in the freezer for a later date. How do you uh, how do you go about that, or do you do that at all? Uh, no, of course I do, and I actually use a chamber vac instead of a little what are what are they called the ones that you can get like at Target that food sealers or whatever. Oh yeah, the food saver. Yeah, yeah. I, food savers are great if you can if that's all you can afford. But to store something long term, it is definitely not the option, not what I would go with. So I use a gas chamber. Um, ones that we use them in the restaurant. I have one at home. They're expensive, but if you're an avid hunter, I mean, spending $800 to keep your meat in the refrigerator, you know, year after year after year is, is not that big of a deal. So, but it makes the biggest difference on preserving the texture and the quality of the meat. You said, um, the, the food saver isn't the way to go if you want to keep, uh, for a long time. What's a long time? So I would never um, keep anything in a food saver bag for more than two months. Two months? Okay. Yeah, because then you're going to get – it doesn't take all the air out. So then you're going to get freezer burn and then it starts, you know, making the meat taste bad. And, I mean, then you're just turning everybody off of it. So Good to know. Because we can't all eat. (laughs) That's right. 50 pounds of goose in one one month. So That is difficult. That is you're yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so you said you use a, uh, I mean, what is it? What does it put in there? What kind of, it's a chamber vac. Okay. You can get them like at restaurant supply stores or I'm sure Amazon has one. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure. Amazon has everything, right? Yeah, they do. <laughs> Including me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, when did you say your, your new TV show comes out or is it out right now? It's out right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And we can find that on, what is it, Amazon TV? Amazon Prime, yeah. Amazon Prime, okay. It's free if you have Amazon Prime. If not, you can buy it. Okay, excellent, excellent. And what kind of content can we see on there? So the season one um, is primarily cooking-based, so it's all me cooking wild game. Um, We thought we were going to a big network that starts with an F, ends with a D. Okay, Uh (laughs) uh-huh. So Uh that's why season one is tailored to that. So um, it's mainly me showing you, I take you from the start of a meal um, with an appetizer to a main course, which is um, always a wild game, and then to a, a simple, easy dessert to go along with it that pairs with your wild game. Uh, season two, um, I'm taking you more on an adventure. You're gonna see you're gonna see me hunting, and then you're gonna see me uh, more cooking in the field and showing you right away how how I would prepare it. So lots of simpler recipes for season two, more foodie esque is season one. Okay, awesome. Uh, and I was actually going to ask you about cooking in the field. If we're at duck camp, um, what's what's a what's a good little go to? Your cast iron pan. <laughs> <laughs> I so, swear I never leave home without it. <laughs> pack, okay, I, okay, we'll start packing that. So yeah, I mean, because you can put it on the grill, you can put it on a flame, you yeah. can put it, you can put it on anything, and and it's it's good. You can put it on charcoal. And it's just going to heat up so perfectly because because that's their job and that's what they do and nothing nothing beats that. So it's like the ultimate way to cook and especially if you're on a grill or a smoker, you can still put it in the cast iron and still you're retaining that fat so you're cooking it in the fat, which is what you want to do because wild uh, waterfowl are leaner so you want to add the fat back into it. So that's why my cast iron skillet never leaves me. <laughs> Good to good to know. I guess I'll just add about ten more pounds to my truck. I know, right? then, so. <laughs> so, okay, what kind of uh, we're getting kind of away from the food now, and I want to transition into a little bit more of your your hunting and your hunting styles. What kind of uh, you said trap got you into waterfowl hunting? Uh, what kind of yes. gun do you use out in the field? I use a Benelli FBE two. Awesome. Twelve gauge. Uh, what kind of uh, shot are you using? Depends on what I'm shooting. Okay. So, so be, go ahead. Uh, let me see. Well, it depends. Yeah. It, I mean, depends on what, if I'm going after quail or if I'm going after pheasant or goose mm-hmm. or anything like that. So it'll change, it'll, it'll change accordingly. Does, and here's something that I didn't even think of until just now. Does your shot preference is it changed because when you're going into the hunt, you are like food centered. So I shoot number twos at everything all season long, um, right. waterfowl wise. Right. Is, is that something that maybe you're like, ooh, number twos? I would never shoot a teal <laughs> with a number two. You know what I mean? Um, um, that I do think of that honestly, but here I am going to be like an oxymoron. So my biggest what I want to do is focus more on getting a good shot and having them pass quickly. Right. So if I need a bigger shot or a smaller shot to do that, then that's what I'm going to do. So I'm not as concerned about like the shot going into the breast meat because I just use fish, like fish tweezers and pull it out and it's not a big deal. But my main thing is like I coming from the animal activist background, I don't want the animal to suffer. So really, like, what is going to make it happen fast? Right. That's kind of like my motto. I probably should, it should probably be more chef centered on that. But that's what I think of. When well, you- I mean, that's why I use number twos all season long because one, I, I have, you know, it's everything exactly. I can do to get a bird to go down. So um, yeah, and then it's either you you hit them good or you miss them good. So right. <laughs> And yeah, and I don't want to miss because I want to eat them, but I want, I want them to pass as fast as possible. And then I'll deal with the after effects kind of later, you know? Yeah. It's like, which one do you want? And yeah, exactly. If I was a bird, I guess I'd want to happen faster. (laughs) Right. Okay. So you said something earlier on, um, you were saying when you went to go buy some ammunition at the store and the guy asked you, 
He said, is this the kind of ammo that your husband wanted? Um, (laughs) So I, you know, recently just, uh, well, me and my wife had a baby girl. And, Uh you know, there's no way she's probably not going to be around hunting or, (laughs) you know, I'm going to do everything I can to try to have her enjoy it. And I guess it's, it's something, you know, a lot more young women are getting into shooting and hunting these days. And it's, I think it's something to be talked about. Uh, It's a, there's differences. Um, If you're going to bring your daughter or your son out, I'm sure. And there's a lot more similarities than anything, but I just kind of wanted your take on introducing young women into this, into the sport and the passion of um, hunting. So, I mean, obviously from my background, I wasn't a hunter, but it's hunting is so much more than just killing an animal. I mean, some of the best memories, this is, you know, this is why I love waterfowl hunting. Waterfowl hunting is actually really fun. One, because you can at least talk to each other. Right. <laughs> you're not having to worry about being quiet so much. I mean, there are times you have to, but it seems like the camaraderie is is more when you're waterfowl hunting. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, it's the whole experience. It's watching the sunset go up. Those in a, in a field or by the water that you would never really see otherwise. It's having, you know, the banter and having the memories made that, you know, with some of the times with your best girlfriends that you would never have otherwise. And you're, you know, what is, it's really fun to get someone who's never done it and pull them out of their element and watch them see actually how wonderful it is. And it's not this gruesome act that people think it is. I mean, granted, we do have bad eggs in the hunting industry and it's not portrayed well, especially through social media. Mm -hmm. So, but once you, once something, somebody experiences the whole aspect of it on like, okay, wow, I actually did shoot this bird and then we did eat it. There's something really magical about that. That's like, it's a getting back to our roots and back to nature. And so that's what I try to really in let people know, like, it's not, it's really beautiful and you'll have a lot of fun and you don't even have to pull the trigger, like just sit and watch and have a good time, you know, especially cause waterfowl, I believe that waterfowl is a great way to start getting into hunting, um, for any, for a woman, especially because probably a, sh- a shotgun is a little bit easier to use than a rifle shooting a, you know, deer or a bit large game at 300 yards. You know, it's much easier when they're 10 yards from you. <laughs> right. Right. What were some of the specific hurdles that you experienced or ran into um, when you, along your path to where you are now? Oh my gosh. Being a female in a male dominated industry, but I'm used to that because I worked in, I, I'm a professional chef. There's not many females in the cooking industry either. So I've dealt with that, but definitely I would say, yeah, being a female and being taken seriously, um, it is another thing. And yeah, I should just keep my mouth shut, but yeah, not taking (laughs) seriously. I mean, mean, there are, there are some wonderful public female hunters. And then I believe there are some that are not helping females being viewed in the most positive light hunting, if that makes sense. I mean, yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I could use another death threat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, oh, so you want oh, me to talk about Yeah, like, yeah. You know? Okay. Sure. Yeah. I just, I don't even know what, what that means. So, so if you look on my Instagram, um, I've actually been called out by fellow hunters by other hunters in the, in the hunting industry, because I don't post the so-called kill shot. My Instagram is not filled with the kill shot. My Instagram shows you the experience of hunting and it will show you the meal that I made. And sometimes I throw in a kill shot. Um, but then when I've gotten attacked on social media by hunters calling me saying that I'm not a real hunter because they don't post those shots, but that's not the trophy to me. The trophy is on my plate and the memories I made with it. So I had to write a whole blog post basically defending myself on why I don't do that. So I, I try to, if somebody comes to my Instagram and they're not a hunter, I kind of want them to see that I'm not an evil person and that it's actually being portrayed in a beautiful light. 
versus some Instagram accounts. Like, do we really need to take pictures with dead animals like that? Is it? I think the most irritating thing to me, and this probably will get me in trouble with some of the people that I know. Um, (laughs) But I, that, you know, that PETA filter that everybody puts on, take selfies, not animals, or shoot selfies, not animals. I absolutely hate it. And I'm sorry, guys and gals, but I hate it when someone puts that filter on their, um, you know, behind their, their, their kill shot. Right, right. So it's, I, in, in several uh, other episodes, I've talked about it, but, you know, there's, you know, 8% of us that are hunters and there's 8% of us that are completely against it. And then everybody in between is who uh, we have to portray ourselves to. Right. I don't think. You know, I don't think to shoot animals or that filter is necessarily helping our cause either. Right. I mean, it's not. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's kind of dis- disrespectful for the animal. That was still a life you took. Why Why are we flashing it amongst media? Does that make sense? Yes, so absolutely. What's the difference between seeing these things that are done to dogs in China than but it's okay for you to post a really distasteful photo of your harvest. Right. Is there a difference? Right. Is it because one's a domestic animal and the other is not? I just don't, I still, to me, I, I, I pay as a chef and an, as the, my hunting philosophy is I have hands on the animal at all times from the harvest. I butcher, I cook, I treat it so my hands never leave it, and that's kind of how I pay respect. And it's really because I'm really thankful to be able to harvest my own meat. So I try to show that in my Instagram instead of kill shots all the time. So if that makes me not a hunter, then I don't know that I'm not a real hunter. (laughs) No, that's good. Um, I think the probably the time that I – not to transition off too quickly, but uh, I think the time – that is where we have most people around, um, wildfowl for me at least is, is Thanksgiving. Um, you know, usually I'm, you know, fresh in, or I'm, I have fresh birds in the freezer and whatnot. And I'm usually trying to either give away, um, some meat, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, have people over to eat meat. Um, and I just kind of wanted to know, uh, what's your favorite, like Thanksgiving, um, slash party or whatever you're, if you're going to have people over, how do mm-hmm. you present, um, the food or the wildfowl, I guess. Wildfowl. Um, yeah. you, so everybody loves pasta. Okay. <laughs> I love pasta. Who doesn't love it? So usually I will turn it into a sauce, whether it's shredded stuff like that. I try not to present it as, as a whole breast because I think non, wild game eaters get turned off, but I, it's, I think it's just, it's just visual seeing a whole duck breast. They're like, Oh no, 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 no. but seeing a chicken is fine. I, I don't, you know, it's, I don't yeah. get it. So I try to disguise it and make it, um, more yeah. in, enhanced, more with flavors and something that there will be like, Oh, I love pasta. So why not? So like, um, so, I mean, that's how red sauces, wine sauces go really well with, um, goose or I'll make raviolis if I have enough time, but usually that's my favorite way because it's, especially if it's a ravioli, they don't even know they're eating it. And they're like, this is so good. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you just that's ate good. snow goose. <laughs> yeah. Usually what I, the way I do it is, you know, I sandwich that thing between, uh, you know, bacon and a jalapeno. And there you go. <laughs> I know that's like the like the most common thing that people do, and um, I think my my first year, I think I ate a lot of jalapenos and bacon. With I did, that's why I started my site. I'm like, I know how to grill a backstrap, and I know how to wrap it in bacon and make a popper out of it. And everybody has these damn popper recipes. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Little chef heart is breaking sometimes. <laughs> Well, not to step too far away from waterfowl, but I just kind of want to wrap this up with, um, can you tell me about your favorite hunt, you know, ever, or the most exciting one you've been on? Like, what is the highlight of your hunting career thus far? 
well, getting that black buck with that 50 cal air gun was, was pretty freaking amazing. Um, but my favorite hunt was probably my belt, my black bear up in Canada. It was my, I like when I started getting into hunting, I was like, Oh, there's no way I'm going to go after a bear. You're crazy. Like <laughs> they hunt me and I'm not going to like, I can't outrun a bear. And right. then, then there I was like trekking the mountains, the backwoods of British Columbia searching for a bear. And it was the most awesome thing ever. And it was the first time I got scoped on that trip too. So I took my bear on my first shot. I got my first scope bite <laughs> <laughs> oh really <laughs> yes i did so like nice. i have my bear forever remembered on my forehead now oh, um awesome. but it was one of those things where it was not what i was expecting and i was like holy cow that was your adrenaline's rushing You're like i i don't know I, I i can swim with sharks and there's something and feel no fear but something about like a bear could literally be around this tree <laughs> and I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't going to touch on it too much, but since you did mention it, what are you doing swimming with sharks? Um, Because I'm crazy. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been, I grew up, my dad is a professional bass fisherman um, out in California. So growing up on the water is something that I have done my whole life. And I've been a water baby ever, ever since I can remember. I mean, I, I learned to swim before I could even walk and sharks have captivated me so much. And so I recently just wanted to go out and swim with them and be with them without a spear gun, without being armed. Cause obviously when you're spear fishing there, there will be sharks cause they hear the movement and sometimes they'll eat your fish off your spear gun. But, um, this time I just went and I wanted to just be with them. And they, to me, they were like the most magical creatures possible they're amazing and they're beautiful and they're not the it's like the metaphor of hunting sharks are not these evil man-eating machines like you people who usually get bit is because they're curious not because they're like oh man they're i want to eat human today like they don't want to eat you like they're that's not that that's not their diet um which is like my association with hunting. Not hunters are not evil. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I just there's something that draws me to them, and I find them to be the most amazing creatures. And I just I I'm a, I just I can't stop. <laughs> well, as a, I guess I would probably get be painted as a land lover, and there, you know, I like the Shark Week on my television, and I I guess. I would really prefer a very big boat between me and a shark, but that's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a shark. Let me jump in. Where are my fins? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't catch me doing that. Uh, but, um, well, all right. Why don't you go ahead and let us know where we can find some more of your content. We already spoke about your TV show, but go ahead and, um, give yourself a little plug so that the listeners can go check you out and check out some of your recipes and, uh, get more of your great, uh, content. Yeah, so you can find um, all my wild game recipes on wildernesstotable.com, and you can catch me on Amazon Prime at um, just search Wilderness to Table. And then I am on also on YouTube um, via the handle Wilderness to Table, as well as Instagram at Wilderness to Table. You can keep up with daily shenanigans there. And then I'm upping my YouTube content because I can't answer everybody's questions via social media all the time. I'm turning to my vlogs now. So I'm just doing like every two weeks I'll produce a new vlog on what I'm doing, what I'm cooking, fun cocktails, things like that, like behind the scenes, everything that kind of people ask me that I just can't fill out 86 answers to. (laughs) So yeah. And where is your, um, you said your restaurant? Yes, I am opening up a restaurant here in Peachtree City, Georgia. Okay. Because I needed another thing to do. <laughs> right, right. So if that we have any listeners in Peachtree City, Georgia, or yes, anywhere close. Yes, the revolution. It'll be open in July. Open in July. Well, that's exciting. And there will be wild game. Oh, very interesting as well. I'll, yes. That'll be something to – how I'll far is – where is Peach? where is Peachtree City, Georgia? Uh, it's just um, about 30 minutes south of Atlanta. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you're at the airport, you're really not far. Right. Well, I'll check that out maybe someday. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chef. Um, 
having me. Yes, no, thank you for coming on, and I appreciate it uh, very much. No problem, anytime. All right, stay safe. You too. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast. Please come join us on our Facebook group, the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast group, where you can connect with a good group of hunters, because we're all in this together. We need to act like it so that hopefully our great, great grandkids will be hunting ducks over our favorite public lands. Uh, We also ask that you go ahead and give us a written review on iTunes and give us five stars if you think we deserve it. And we really do want to hear back from you uh, so that we can give you the best possible content. And if you get in on that Facebook group, you can get in there and you can ask questions and you can tell us what you want to hear next or you can tell us uh, what you don't like. And we'll be sure to tailor things to our listeners. So, all right. Stay safe out there and we will see you next week.